Hello, in this video I will be reviewing nursing responsibility during intubation. There are several sections in the process of intubation, generally referred to as 7 P's. Preparation, pre-oxygenation, pre-treatment, paralytic with induction, positioning, placement, and post-intubation management. In preparation section, the nurse may have to ensure the necessary equipment is in the room, such as oxygen access at the wall is functioning, and extra oxygen tank is in the room. Two sets of suction in case of emesis and secretions, back valve mask with filter and hook to the oxygen. non rebreather with 15 liters flow rate and reservoir bag fully inflated. Monitoring equipment is on and working, and tidal CO2 detector is in the room. IVs are functioning. Appropriate drugs such as anesthetics, analgesics, sedation, paralytics for intubation, fluids, and pressor for hypotension is in the room if requested by the provider. In most cases, provider or specialist in charge of intubation will have the medications with them. Nurse may need to ensure that laryngoscope and glidoscope are ready and functioning. And again, specialists in charge of intubation may have these tools with them. Nurse have to ready endotracheal tubes and extra tubes and may need to test the balloons. Um, a nurse has to also assess for difficulty of intubation, such as neck injury, C collar, uh, in place, obesity, short neck, asthma, low blood pressure, head injury. Uh, these conditions may require adjustments during the intubation. Uh, for example, such as uh, if it's a larger patient, raising their head higher and supporting their back, which is called ramping. Um, so the nurse also has to adjust the head of the, the, the height of the bed and remove the backboard. Uh, to allow easier access to the head of the patient. Uh, also to ensure that oral airways is in the room and crash card with pads are on the patient and monitoring, personal protective equipment and intubation trays or kids is in the room. Next is pre-oxygenation. That is done to achieve oxygen reserve in the patient while the patient is being intubated and not breathing. Patient kept at 100% SpO2 for 3 to 5 minutes. That is achieved with high flow nasal cannula with non rebreather or bag valve mask and, and or BiPAP. Next is pretreatment. Uh, with lidocaine or fentanyl to achieve analgesia. Uh, it is used to decrease irritation of the throat during laryngoscopy. Lidocaine is used to decrease spasms in asthmatics during intubation. Next is paralytic and induction. First is induction to sedate the patient and then the paralytic to relax the musculature. Induction usually achieved with etanidate, ketamine, propofol, and uh, lorazepam versus. Etanidate has little effect on blood pressure and is hemodynamically friendly. However, myoclonic jerking can be seen with uh, etanidate. As well as etanidate does not have effect on intracranial pressure, so it's safe with head injuries. Contraindications could be adrenal suppression which decreases steroid synthesis and patients have a higher likelihood to vomit with uh, etomidate. Ketamine does not suppress respirations and actually releases catecholamines which increase heart rate and blood pressure which is good in situations of shock. Also bronchodilation is seen with ketamine. However, ketamine contraindicated in cardiac and uh, neurologically impaired patients because it can lead to farther damage. Um, 
Propofol is a potent anticonvulsant, uh, but unfortunately causes cardiovascular depression, leading to hypertension. Common paralytics are succinylcholine and rocuronium. Sox is fast-acting and quickly broken down, quick on and off effects. It is possible to avoid complications related to paralytic itself and mechanical ventilation with succinylcholine. However, it has some potential contraindications, such as malignant hypothermia. Dantrolin is the treatment for malignant hypothermia. Contraindications for SUX can be also hyperkalemia, renal patient, burn patient, and crush injuries. Rocuronium, on the other hand, does not have these contraindications and side effects, but it is much longer lasting, which can require longer intubation and ventilation, hence more complications of mechanical ventilation. Next is positioning. Usual position is what is referred to as sniffing position, with face parallel to the ceiling, and with auditory meatus at the level of the sternal notch. Larger patients may require assistance of elevation of the head and the upper back with blankets to achieve desired position for intubation, which is called ramping. Laying just flat for a larger patient would be ineffective position for intubation. Next is placement. Once trained and certified provider in intubation placed the tube, it is important to verify the placement. First with CO2 detector. This type of color-based CO2 detector changes color to yellow when it detects CO2 coming out of the lungs on exhalation. It will remain purple if no CO2 is detected. It can be easily remembered as yellow is gold and gold is good what we want. Purple patient is not a it's not good, so we don't want purple. Purple color may indicate that endotracheal tube is in the esophagus. Listening in the epigastric area also gives information if endotracheal tube is in the esophagus, if gurgling and sound of passing air is auscultated. Also visualizing bilateral equal chest rise and auscultating both lungs gives information that both lungs are ventilating. It is possible that endotracheal tube was pushed too far and it is in the right main stem bronchi. Final and definitive verification is the chest x-ray. Endotracheal tube should be 2 to 6 cm above the carina. At this point, tube should be marked for length of insertion at the T. Next is post-intubation management. Securing the tube with appropriate holder, commercial holder, or ties. Respiratory therapist most likely has ventilator set up and ready at the bedside for mechanical ventilation. Decreased blood pressure is common after intubation due to increased intrathoracic pressure, which leads to decreased venous return. Also, medications such as propofol can cause hypotension. Treatment with bolus of fluids can contract decreased venous return and pressors such as norepinephrine vivo can counteract propofol. Maintenance sedation will be prescribed by a provider to keep patients comfortable. It, now onto the nursing role during intubation. It is important for the nurse to monitor heart rate, electrocardiogram, rhythm, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and antidote CO2. Heart rate can go bready from decreased O2 and vagal stimulation. Patient could develop a lethal arrhythmia. Blood pressure can drop due to medications. Antidote CO2 would signify effective ventilation. The nurse should monitor O2 saturation and verbalize desaturation during the procedure. Patient is at 90%. Patients below 85%, 84, 83, 82, and so on, due to providers' focus on procedure, not on the monitor. Stopping, reoxygenating, and reventilating the patient may be necessary to reattempt the intubation. 
Nurse should remove the dentures to assist with intubation. Nurse should pre-oxygenate the patient for 3-5 to five minutes with nasal cannula and non-rebreather or other devices. Nurse should identify roles of other nurses to ventilate the, the patient with BVM, BVM, sometimes administer medication, assess and monitor patient, and note uh, that each intubation is less than 30 seconds. Nurse should note the time the sedative and paralytic was given, note when intubation happened, size the marking of the placement of, on the tube, note the time of the reading of the CO2, listen to the lungs, verify that x-ray was ordered, place in a nasogastric or orogastric tube to avoid vomiting with intubation, keep soft restraints on hand. So you just made it to the end of the video. If you found the video useful, please click that like button. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for watching and I wish you great success.